Okay, Gio, I'm going to start off with one of your questions. I'm going to pose it to myself. Right off the bat. Yeah, what's my favorite thing about Nick Clark? Ready? He makes me laugh every time I talk to him, almost immediately. Not <laughs> at, at him, although that may be a little bit at him. But at, at his, his laugh it's bad is very if contagious. you laugh immediately, because I, that means that it's something about my face. <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't take long in a conversation that I'm having a great time. And that, that's, I can't say that about most people. Like when I think of Nick Clark, I think, I mean, there's a lot going for you. You're smart, you know, amazing brand. There's a lot of, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't laugh enough. And I laugh all the time when I'm with you, you always have a good story. You've got, and it can be little, it can be something little, although you do mostly have good stories and mostly they're at your own expense. I was about to that was my next comment. Most of his great stories involve him doing something that the rest of us would be like, I wouldn't have done that, but all right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's basically the story of my life right there. So <laughs> it is what it is. Yes. Anyway, that's one of my favorite things about Nick Clark. Thank you for joining us today. You haven't even introduced him yet. Everyone I know. knows who Everybody he is. Everybody knows anyways, who but... Nick Clark is, though. All I had to do was say his name. Nick Clark, how do we introduce you these days? You were the founder of Common Desk. I still am the founder of Common You're Desk. still the founder of Common Desk. <laughs> I'm just not the CEO. I mean, you, you're, yeah, you're, you're on to the next chapter. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Gio, you go now. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I love about Nick, he's always up for everything. Like our last, I reached out to him trying to connect and figure out what he's doing. I'm hearing all this stuff, right? Because everyone knows who he is. And he's like, how about we work out? let's meet for a workout meeting. And I'm just like, what? He's like, I'll bring lunch. <laughs> Little did I know that I was going to be running and doing burpees for 45 minutes, but I like it. he's, he's always up for anything. We uh, did. We but... did have the, we had a very romantic picnic in the middle of the we woods. Did. It was, we did. It was, like, it was, although I spilled the all of them everywhere, but it was great. Oh no, it was more romantic than that. Like Mixed greens with quinoa, some Ooh. ground beef, Ooh. sparkling so my, water. My new thing, since I have almost nothing to do, is <laughs> you know, when, I'm, when I'm meeting up with a friend, like cook for them, we go get a workout in, we get to it. share yeah. a little lunch or a dinner together. It's it's honestly a nice way for me to drink a little less and work out a little more. So mm, I like that. That's good. That's good. Fun. Especially I'll tell you, non-drinking workout Nick Clark is just as fun as drinking Nick Clark. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I've yeah. seen drinking Nick Clark plenty of times, but <laughs> Nick made us come down when we were in Dallas for the GWA conference. Nick was like, oh, we're having sushi at this place. And rush hour was, it took us like an hour and a half to get there. And we get yeah, down there. Terrible. He's like, it's my favorite place. You got to come. So we all, Mara drives and we all go down there and I have a, oh, this is karaoke night when you posted me. And I was like, Gio, take that down. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no. You, said yes. so you, you, you told me someone night. else had a problem with it. And then we rolled up the window and she's, they're like, nah, that's Jamie telling you she's got a problem with it. The old, uh, the old video that went viral on LinkedIn for five minutes before it got <laughs> mysteriously erased. Exactly. We had like spicy mango margaritas or something. And we had, I mean, this was all Nick Clark inspired, had the best time on the ride home singing. And then we go do actual karaoke and right. Geo takes a video and puts it on LinkedIn, which is a professional network. Anyway. Yeah. And goes back to, Hey, Nick, we just, at, speaking of switch yards, we just finished at, uh, uh podcast with lg from and like and we were talking about transparency you know and the, sometimes people like us forget and you're the same way that not everyone is okay with posting everything about our lives right because i'm like i i don't care right i am who i am like it or not i forget that there's enneagram threes that that are uh very caring about their uh their image you care a lot so. about what people think that's right but also you don't drink and therefore don't do you know karaoke under the influence so you save yourself uh, some let, let me rewind i drink and i know what happens when i drink and so i'm careful where and who i drink around <laughs> so we'll just we'll just go there pro tip pro tip yeah how do you get All into right. your like your your coveted drinking circle do you, is it like a circle of trust that you have to be in or what is it? Well, it's, you already know I have no filter. So then when I drink, the filter yeah. comes off and I okay. say things and do things that 
therefore come back and burn me. And so I spent enough on the ICSC circuit and put myself in bad enough situation where I'm like, hmm, eight tequilas ago, that would have not happened. <laughs> eight tequilas ago. Um, but either way, we, we've totally digressed. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, I don't even know where we're going. Why don't we yeah, start Jamie, with- Jamie said she's on a time clock here and we've spent I know, and we're talking about eight, nothing yeah, so okay. far. Okay. <laughs> You, you so start it. off, Jamie. Get us back on track. You've got yeah. pre-questions, I'm sure, in your head. I have so I have so many questions. What do I want to ask? Then you go. So for those people that don't know your background, I mean, you come from a traditional corporate brokerage background. You kind of want to talk about real quickly kind of how you got to the yeah. point that you saw the opportunity for the flexible workspace, co-working, and started the the location which is actually in my background i think this is the expanded location even right that's the, yeah uh, that's the og bomb location that's the og right there and so kind of what what caused you to see that and walk away from the the brokerage model and and build something so unique well yeah i guess in my you know when i was in my 20s i worked for a company that owned leased and managed about five million square feet of office space in dallas and it was a smaller company, which is great because I kind of got to do a little bit of everything, but I was mainly on the leasing side of the business. And, you know, I mean, I, I was 25 or whatever. And I mean, as a 25 year old, you barely know anything. <laughs> and, and, you know, so I'm out there trying to lease but office space. You, but know you think you know everything, yeah. but you barely know anything. <laughs> I'm out there trying to lease office space. And it was just, it was honestly mind boggling on how just, difficult it is for the end user to actually lease space. And I, my my favorite times of just kind of trying to assess and understand the, demi- de- the demand side of the market was when a tenant would come into one of our office buildings and, and, and they didn't have a broker. And they would come in with like their backpacks on. And at this point, it's like 2010, 2011, you know, we've got Wi-Fi, we've got plenty of technology to where we should and could be able to get people in office space, but they would come in like, hey, great news. We just raised our Series A. We've got three employees. We're going to hire three more. We need some office space. We like this office building. When can we? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I'd be like, hey, that's great. I've got some bad news. This whole process is going to take about 10 months. (laughs) And, you know, I mean, like by the time we're in, you know, we're out of the the odds and into the 2010s or whatever, you know, the technology was there to where companies were moving much faster than they ever had before. And so by the time we could get a company into actual office space, there's a good chance they would have tripled in size or gone out of business 10, min- 10 months later. And so it just that entire process showed me that that something was severely broken. And then I would say on top of that, as you guys kindly referenced at the very beginning of this call, I like to have a great time doing whatever we're doing. And we spend, you know, eight to 12 hours a day at the office. And I'll never forget, I had an internship in my between my junior and senior year of college. It was my first time to have a job inside of like a multi-tenant office building. And I was depressed. <laughs> It sucked. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is the how real people world. spend a third of their life just like in this cubicle, just slowly dying. And so, you know, I think it was just, you know, it was a culmination of all of those different experiences to where I was like, man, I just want, I want to go create something to where people can transact within minutes as opposed to months where it's extremely fun and engaging and experience oriented. And actually, I, not a whole lot of people know this, but I quit my job in commercial real estate not to start a co-working space. I quit my job in commercial real estate to start a property management company that heavily focused on the experiences of being in the office building. It was basically kind of flipping the model upside down of putting the best people in property management and then just really automating and streamlining the leasing experience so we're not having to pay a ton of money for the 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 leasing associates and so i had a ownership group in my back pocket i left my job i thought i had three buildings that were going to kind of launch this property management company 
And about a month into it, I get a call from this group and they're like, hey, really bad news. We spoke to you know, our founding partner in Atlanta. I'm not going to name any names, but spoke to our founding partner in Atlanta. And he basically came back and said, we just, we cannot give this to a 28 year old. <laughs> it's just too big of a portfolio. And so we're so sorry. We can offer you a job. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, we're not going to be able to move forward with what we originally agreed to. And I remember I had one of those nights where I'm like, I think, I think I told Gio the story actually recently. I had one of those nights where I'm like at home, I open a bottle of whiskey and I'm just like, man, I have committed career suicide over here. Well, I quit my job for this and now I've got nothing lined up. I look like a complete idiot, but that's where serendipity kind of kicks into the story. Cause I had a, I had a friend flip me a website. It was actually Coco brand out of Minneapolis. Yeah. It was like the first co-working website that I put my eyes on. It was the, it was my introduction to co-working. And I remember just sitting there at home devouring this website. Cause I was like, you're devouring oh whiskey gosh. and the website. Yeah, I'm like, okay, <laughs> right, we're going to be able to throw out of this hole. <laughs> was it, was it juicy or what was the website? No, know- it, was, it was their okay. actual, it was Coco's actual website. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And so it was mine. Yeah. It was my, my first, you know, just experience with co-working and I, immediately fell in love. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is I didn't know that story. I mean I met yeah, you. this is I was like, this is it. Yeah. This is what I this is yeah. this feels like a more bite-sized version yeah. of what I you know originally set out to create. And I love the fact that it was so heavily focused around the entrepreneur, around the small business, because I think that that's truly kind of where my heart was and and you know who I wanted to build product for. And so it was like two days after that, and I was like, there's got to be a global co-working conference. And that's when I stumbled upon Juicy and bought a ticket. And that was March of 2012. And, you know, six months later, we opened Common Desk. So <laughs> there to, you have to it. To this day, Liz says that she's the one that told you to open Common Desk. Well, Liz was the one that told me not to do 20,000 square feet on my, you know, on my, my first try. She's first like, fight. yeah. yeah. You're going to go out of business, man. Did you, did you, want <laughs> you to got do to do three or 4,000 square feet. Yeah. Which she was right. The way we, the way we were able to kind of launch, you know, bit by bit and, and slowly build the, the momentum that we eventually did was the right, right way to do it. Even though it's almost impossible to make money in 3,000 square right. feet. <laughs> Liz likes to tell people things. It's sometimes not the best advice, but... She gives a lot of confidence, though, with everything yeah. she says. And so you do believe her. <laughs> you don't want to question her. Wait, what, what was your floor plate kind of, what are the current common desks? 720? The, like modern day common desks would be closer to like 30,000 square okay. feet. We typically take about a floor and a half or so. Um, so yeah, 3,000 square feet. But it was a nice, it was, it was a nice start. The actual original 3,000 square feet is everything on the right side of Geo's head right now. Oh, wow. Okay. So some of that's an expansion. I'll tell one more fun story from that early, those early days, those, those orange chairs and in, in the background of Geo's picture. Like it, when I started Common Desk, we didn't go out and raise equity capital. We didn't go out and get a, a bank loan. I, I sold my car. I sold my house and this one piece of land I had and truly just went all in, all in on my entire balance sheet to start Common Desk. And of course, with you know any construction project, we were over budget. And so I'll never forget, like we had like, it was a little over like $5,000 in the bank account. And that was for my operating account and for whatever whatever else I needed. Listeners, for do not try this at home. No, this is, I mean, nobody's going to write a book on how we did it. <laughs> <laughs> so literally, I have to, like, I hadn't bought chairs yet. And we all, we all know that chairs are pretty freaking expensive and I needed about a hundred of them. And I was like, dude, I, if, if I pay a hundred bucks a chair, I'm that's going to be $10,000. I only have like five left and I've, I got to deal with my operating shortfalls here somehow, some way. So who are you going to so, call? Who do you call? I called, I called my mom. Yep. <laughs> and, and and I was like, mom, you got to help me up. We, we got to go find some used office chairs. And and mom was like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go say a, say a few prayers 
hope, you know, <laughs> hope God will, will deliver. I was like, mom, I don't need you praying. I need you to go help me find some chairs like at the Goodwill or something. Anyways, mom like hangs up the phone. It's like, power prayer is going to work, son. Just give me a minute. Literally, I get a call like 30 minutes later from a Dallas broker. Okay. His name's Russ Johnson. Good dude. And he's like, hey, man. He's like, how are things going with Common Desk? And I was like, well, decently well. I mean, we're opening in a couple of weeks. I was like, but man, we are, we, 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 we currently have no chairs and I don't have much money left to even buy chairs. So I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's like, he's like, dude, you're not going to believe this, but there's a vacancy in one of my buildings that has like 120 of these like retro looking office chairs in the exact color that you branded Common Desk with. He's like, you want to come take a look at them? I was like, yeah. He's, I, I was like, what do you want from? He's like, I'll tell you what, if you'll just rent a margarita machine for our, whatever it was, the Cinco de Mayo party or whatever, he's like, you can have them. <laughs> and so we got 120 beautiful retro uh, chairs for about, I don't know, maybe $150. <laughs> Those are one of my favorite stories early on. Didn't your mom That's pick out your conference room chairs though? I don't, I don't remember her picking out the conference room chair. She did She did do a decent amount of decorating in the- Okay, I thought those, mom was a little bit involved yeah. in the design in she, the early she was days. Pretty, she was pretty heavily involved before we actually hired a design team. Yeah. Okay, wait, can I ask a question? I'm going to ask a business question. T tell me lessons learned on doing a coffee brand. I wouldn't do Oops. it again. <laughs> okay. I, I'll tell you, and that lesson was a bigger lesson than just doing a coffee brand. I, I think the lesson was actually like stay very focused on the core product. Um, and I think the coffee brand, even though it was a lot of fun, we had a ton of fun doing it. And so I do not regret any of my memories from it. I do think, though, it might have been a bit of a distraction from continuing to improve the product that is Common Desk. And then we we never fully integrated it uh, in a way that I think capitalized on all of the work that we did with actually creating a coffee brand. You do you like food and beverage as part of the offering works absolutely. Offering? Yeah, I do. Okay, I do. I just I I think a fully separate coffee brand to where you know at one point we were going around and, and telling landlords, hey, we'll be your co-working provider, yeah. we'll be your coffee provider. We even people probably mostly forgot this, but we bought a fitness brand that we ended up selling pretty immediately after. I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> I was going Let's to bring up all the, like, I'm, I'm going to air it all out. I'm Because at one point we were obsessed, like this vertical integration of saying, hey, landlord, you need amenities in your building and, and we can bring you amenities yep. of different types. Not only are we going to bring them to you, but we can also cash flow that space for you. Yep. Um, sounded good on paper, but yeah. in reality, it was just... It, it was a lot, you know, and, and the co-working business was already hard enough. And so if I had to do it over again. I would absolutely improve the F and B offering of common desk, probably in a very big way, but I, I wouldn't launch all of these separate brands and these separate offerings. Okay. What, but Gio, you can go. I just have to say, no, one no, more you said you had one I've more question always, that I've always liked about Nick. You, I think you were early. I mean, you were an early operator in the, grand scheme of things you've been doing this for how long when did you start common desk 2012 yeah i think i missed the first i opened in chicago in 2012 and i missed that very first juicy because i was like i just opened and i have a six months old six yeah. three four month old i don't know it's like i'm not going but you you know i always thought you had an advantage with your real estate background and i know liz does not like real estate and co-working to be talked about in the same but your thinking was always I, you know, like the ecosystem, right? Like coffee, co how do we bring more to a building? You speak the landlord's language. You went after management agreements early. So like the real estate piece from like a practical perspective, but also I just was always like, what's Nick thinking about now? You know, really creative, like what's next? You know, what like hospitality, your team, your culture, the Airstream, <laughs> the fitness center. I mean, but you know, you were willing to just push and experiment and, you know, you just like, whatever, you know, we're really, I don't know, brave or I don't know if it's bravery to you, but just like happy to like push the envelope and, and Young, see, you know, naive. what's next. Okay, <laughs> There's other words. 
I love it. So the interesting part to me is all it all ties in the property management model that he was trying to yeah. to, to play out, right? It, it was true. even the the if you, even if you think about the management deals, property managers are paid, you know, like a management deal, right? It's not it's not like that. So kind of was that your thinking, Nick? You were still trying to do the whole property management model without really doing property management? Is that what you were trying to? Yeah, you know, at the like the very end, right before we were acquired, we actually you know, we launched our first building in Dallas, where it was completely vertically integrated, where our in-house design team designed the entire programming and all of the aesthetics of the building, and then we not only <clears throat> operated the coffee and the co-working, but we were the property managers and the leasing team on the project. Now it was a 70,000 square foot building. It was not a 200,000 square foot building, yep. um, but we were heading in that direction. And really the, the point of that was not because we wanted full control of the experience of the building. I do like that, but it was more, more from the standpoint of there's so much redundancy in our business, right? I mean, especially as operating expenses have gone up, you know, if you're in a 30,000 square, if you're operating a 30,000 square foot co-working space in a 200,000 square foot building, you're adding another, depending on how you operate, another 20 to $25 a square foot in operating expenses on that particular space. And all of these expenses, all of these redundant expenses and, you know, have done nothing but continued to drive rates through the roof for, you know, what you have to charge the end user. And so I think part of the reason why we were kind of obsessed with trying to get to operating the entire building was that it would reduce those redundancies. It would massively reduce cost. You're almost getting rid of $20 a square foot in co-working operating expenses, which of course can increase margin or you can decrease price point and better compete with everybody else in the market. And so, yes, I've always been obsessed with trying to figure out the entire building. And I've honestly always hated the fact that, you know, with, with a common desk, you still had to walk through, you know, this kind of sterile common area lobby of the office building before you, you, you arrived at the common desk ex experience. And so, you know, I think the dream was always to try to say, Hey, we want one holistic experience from the point that, that you arrive on site to the point that you're walking in the door and yeah, we, we, we did it once, but I will say this, what, what we learned on the one time we did it was that it is insanely hard. It really is hard. I mean, property management is a tough business. And so I, I think we could have eventually gotten it right if we have a stuck, stuck with it, but it, 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 it was tough. So, I mean, I think one of the things I love about you most is just your, your passion for people, right? And it, it's funny, we just got done with LG and that was his deal too. But I mean, the culture that you built at Common Desk was incredible, right? No matter what space I walked into, I knew how I was going to feel walking in and walking out based off of your team. Um, obviously, that's something very intentional on your part. Um, kind of how did you go about building that team? Obviously, as as you started, it was really just you. And then as you built, you brought in people that helped you create that. What was that overall trajectory of, of, of building that culture? I think it goes back to your first 10 hires, you know, and I, I, I'm very grateful that, you know, 10 years ago, we were able to get our first 10 hires insanely right or they, they made me look very, very good. Mm -hmm. But those first 10 hires, it's like people would, would, would say all the time, like, how do you keep attracting great people? It's like, well, great people attract great people. And so kind of once we had that nucleus in place, once we had that core group of the first eight to 10 of us, everybody else, it seemed like we hired was just a buddy of the core group. It's like, oh, I went to college with that person. She's an incredible person. We've got to bring her on the team. And so there was a snow snowball effect to it. I think that was part of it. The other part of it was just, man, we we spent all of life together looking back on those years. I mean, I was young. Katie Joe was around at that time, my life partner, but we didn't have kids yet or anything. And so it felt like we lived at Common Desk day and night. And if we weren't at Common Desk, we're at some startup event or at the bar, like I mean, we were just around each other 
at all times. And I think that can either produce a very toxic culture or that can produce a wonderful culture if you've got the right people in place and and you're doing it for the right reasons. And going back to, I mean, for us, I, I think we we were just having fun. I mean, it was, that's why we were, that's why we got into the coffee business. That's why we bought an Airstream. That's why like <laughs> that persuaded a lot of the decisions we were making. Cause we were just, we were having a good time and it didn't feel like work. And when that is your company culture, you're going to, you're going to attract great people. And I mean, you brought up Katie Joe and you and I got, got a chance uh, during our workout session to, to kind of talk about that and your your love story, if you will, if you want to call it that, right? And you you seen her for the first time and her being a free spirit going all over the place. How has she helped you get to where you've got how she kind of slowed you down or balanced you out and and helped you along your way? She always seems to be the person that can, like, I have very strong opinions about everything. And at least half the time I'm very wrong, but I present them as facts. <laughs> <laughs> and so she calls my bullshit really well, which I, I I love that about her, but probably more so than that. She was just insanely supportive along the way. I mean, you know, 10 plus years of working on a startup. And for most of those 10 years, we were making no money and she was okay with it. And so there, it, I never felt like there was a ticking time clock to where I had to figure out a way to make this work or something of that nature. We just we did it. And, and so I, I'm forever grateful just for, for her patience on it. And then for just the trust, I think she had in myself and, and our, our crew that at some point things were going to hopefully work out. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that makes such a difference to be surrounded by people that support you. Right. And you've had um, a couple great key staff members that have been part of your team that have helped uh, with that along the way. I mean, Dawson was huge in helping you grow the real estate side of, of, of things. You had Althea that was huge in helping you on the operational side of, of stuff. Um, I know, Jamie, you've spent some time with with Althea and just kind of having that conversation of of, of some of those things and helping helping the team grow. I you think know. you're going to say Althea, but oh, every oh, time yeah. you say her name, it comes out with something. <laughs> oh, the, the, yeah. <laughs> Althea. Alethea. Alethea. Yes, there was some there were some great people that there were definitely pillars to kind of supporting the efforts over the years. And I got with entrepreneurship, I mean, with this business and any other business, I mean, it is there, there are some dark days, you know, and so you need a great supporting staff or, around you. But, you know, when you're in bed, sleepless at night, not knowing how you're going to make payroll in seven days, that can be tough. And so, you know, I, I do think it's it can be much more lasting when you've when you've got the right supporting cast, and we we so, certainly had that over the years, thankfully. Okay, I want to hear about what do you think is what do you think is next for? Well, I want to know what's next for you, but like, what what where's the industry going? What are like what's interesting to you? What do you think we're gonna see? Maybe stay the same, or what's gonna change? I want to hear the. We probably need a bottle of whiskey for this, but give it a yeah, shot. Yeah, you know I. I think what I'm hoping for in this industry is that as it continues to mature, you're going to see, you know, some brands that hone in even more on the experiences that are being created inside of the spaces and that, you know, some companies are going to be willing to pay even much more than what co-working spaces are charging right now because they value the culture and the experiences and everything that is happening within the space. And so I hope there are some brands that are going to just triple down yeah. on experience and say, hey, we are going to charge for it. And we believe some people are going to pay it because then I see other brands like, you know, Regis is doing this where they're basically saying, hey, like we're, we're going to spin up as much space as humanly possible and I, no judgment there. Um, I like my buddy Wayne and those guys over there. But I, got, you know, I think that is hitting a certain audience. It says, hey, we, we just want to check the box of having some office space and having a desk and having a place to go. But it's certainly a bit of a far cry from, I think, where co-working started, you know, 
and of it being a community of it being laser focused on the audience. And so I hope we continue to see more experience, experiential and communal oriented kind of brands that are, that are coming out in this next era of co-working. And I, I personally hope it starts happening across entire buildings, you know, and, and not just stuck in 10 to 30,000 square feet. Cause I think that's where, you know, if you think back on like the 2017, 2018, like JLL and CBRE reports and be like, Hey, by 2030, <laughs> you guys all remember this like oh, by yeah. 2030, 30%. Black's 30 office is going to be yeah. 40% of the entire office landscape. And I, I personally think that as flex office operators, we've in some ways failed to meet that, that forecast thus far, you know, cause the demand is there. Everybody wants this. Every, nobody wants to go into a shitty seven year traditional lease. Like everybody wants more flexibility, more experiences, you know, a, a better designed space. And I think that is what co-working and flex office has to offer, but we're a bit stuck in both the lease and even the management agreement model of saying, hey, we're going to go print out 10 to 30,000 square foot spaces. And I, I, I do think and I hope operators will start thinking bigger than that in a business model that works, not one that leases 200,000 square feet and does giant enterprise leases that don't cover rent. Jamie looks at me like she wants me to ask the next question, but she really has more questions to ask. I want to kind of step back and and talk about kind of the 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 WeWork acquisition. Obviously, not the details of it, but I mean, going from being super entrepreneurial and being able to to turn on a dime and make decisions, and then becoming part of a a large corporation like WeWork. I mean, obviously, it it puts you in positions where you can't make the same decisions as you were making before. You know, you and I have never had this conversation personally, but I mean. Kind of looking at that, I mean, it, 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 your people was a big part of why you made those decisions from what, what I've heard and putting you in a position to, to, to help serve them and, and the growth and everything else. I mean, what can you share? What do you want to share about kind of what that process was like for you? Because I know it wasn't an easy decision that you took lightly. Yeah, I'm happy to share on it. And I, I don't think I've publicly actually spoken to this yet, but you know, I think most entrepreneurs dream of saying, hey, we're going to start something from scratch. We're going to go raise some equity. We're going to scale it and eventually sell it to the largest competitor in our industry. That is why a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, start and scale a company. That was never my dream. You know, my dream and really what we preached for a decade at Common Desk for that was that we were building an evergreen company, one that could last forever. And that was one of the reasons why we never went out and raised outside equity. We're like, hey, we're going to scale at a pace that makes sense for us with, you know, with what we have on the balance sheet. And that was the plan the entire time. Um, you know, we we were executing that plan, I think, fairly well. In 2018, 2019, we were ex experiencing a, a ton of growth, um, and we were still a, a cash flow positive business at that time. But the same thing happened to Common Desk that happened to everybody in 2020. You know, COVID hit in March of 2020. You know, I can say that I think we might have stretched a bit too far in 2019. I mean, we were we were stepping on the gas pedal hard at that point. But in 2020, March of 2020, COVID hits, I don't know, 75% of our revenue walks out the door, you know, middle of March. And we actually had a, for the first time ever, we had a term sheet, you know, to do a small, it was like a $3 million equity round. We had a signed term sheet in February of 2020. COVID hits, those investors call me. They're like, hey, no, we've got a signed term sheet, but... 75% of your revenue just disappeared. We we cannot move forward with this right now. And it's like, hey, I completely understand. I remember getting off the, that call and thinking, we are so screwed. Where's the whiskey? Um, yeah, back to the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure out something. <laughs> you know, and so 2020 was obviously just as tough on us as it was on everybody. 
you know, and we survived with some of the PPP loans and the EIDL loans, and we were able to get into 2021. But by mid 2021, those were starting to run a bit dry. And, you know, I remember in it was August of 2021 when I had to approach my leadership team and just say, hey, guys, like we've I, we, we have knocked on, I think it was 306 doors at that point, you know, having you know, meetings of going out and trying to raise this equity round. And there, we just were not having any luck. And so even WeWork doesn't know the backstory on this. <laughs> but, you know, the, you know, what was decided in that meeting, I'm telling you, people are crying in this meeting. I mean, it was an awful, it was probably one of the worst meetings I ever had to lead, but it was just, yeah, I knew it was time to be completely transparent. It's like, hey, we've got about 60 days of, of runway left here before we need to have like a seismic change in this organization, either laying off most of corporate staff or drastically cutting salaries. I mean, we're, we are going to have to do something uh, surgical to make it past the 60 day mark. And so we came up with a plan in that meeting of saying, Hey, you know, leadership team, you guys go build a runway that, gets us well past 60 days because we can't do anything in 60 days. Like we yeah. need at least 180 days to even put together some sort of a transaction. And I was tasked with going to call our competitors. Um, and so first call was to a friend of mine at WeWork who kind of sat right underneath the executive level. And you know, we basically said, hey, look, like uh, we're, we're the industry leader in the United States when it comes to asset light management agreements. We've got a great, great brand down here in Texas. We're dominant in the Texas markets. We think we have a growth engine that we work would be really interested in. And, and, and they were first meeting with Sandeep, the CEO at that time in 2021 went very well. Him and I hit it off and um, we had a signed term sheet with WeWork about three weeks after that. And so things started moving pretty quickly. And then, and then I had six months of due diligence with WeWork and <laughs> doing a six month due diligence period with a, a public company when you're just a, not only were we a private company, but we never had a board. It was just me. So it was, that was an interesting period of getting the data room put together and making sure that we were dotting the I's and crossing all of the T's, but but we ended up getting there after about a six month process, and that that entire transaction closed in March of 2022. And so, look, it was bittersweet. I mean, it it you sell your company, you get a nice little payday. That's that's great, but it's it was never the plan, and it it does like it sometimes feel like a bit of a failure in the fact that we weren't able to kind of make it to to being that evergreen company that we that we dreamt of. And so, you know, it's, uh, but at, at the same time, I, I, I look back on it and I think it was an incredible chapter. We all had incredible memories of, of what we built and that still remains. And so that'll be evergreen for sure. Yeah. And, and the awesome, the awesome part about it is you still built something amazing that, that changed the way people look at real estate. Right. I mean, I was just on the phone uh, yesterday looking at I'm looking at uh, some stuff in Houston they're like well is it something like common desk because we really love what common desk has and so you know there, there's a lot of of stuff that that you have to be proud of and excited about and, and everything else and so hey, kudos to you for for what you built and you know you you exited on on your terms at the right time and now you get to go build something with the experience you've got Yep, exactly. I am looking forward to that. So, I mean, we we did kind of jump into some of those conversations when when we were together and kind of obviously there's there's some stuff you you can share, some stuff that you're not ready to share. Kind of where where's your head at where you are today of kind of trying to figure out what the, what the future looks like and and what you want to build uh for you and your family. Yeah, I would say like if I hone in on the things that I just I love to do, I'm a communalist at heart. And so I love building community, as I think most co-working entrepreneurs are. I'm I'm a placemaker. I love I love to build beautiful places. And I think a newfound joy of mine is like, man, I I had the time of my life 
like leading and developing Common Desk over the last 10 years. It was it was truly a passion project and it was it was so much fun. And I in my 20s, I dreamt of being an entrepreneur, was able to go make that happen. And now I like what I'm realizing is that I, I think I really love helping other people become entrepreneurs and go pursue their dreams. And so, you know, I think like my future is going to look something like helping others go realize their dreams and be able to go pursue their passions. It'll be in the placemaking business. It'll be in the community business. And I'm exploring 50 different ideas right now that, you know, that are all like, you know, have those ingredients wrapped up in them. And so I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm eager to get back at it, but at the same time, I'm enjoying being, you know, the primary parent at home and picking up my son from school. And and Gio, I think I told you about my sourdough bread making, which I've got a loaf going to Dawson and and his wife Mary tonight. They just had a kid, so I'm enjoying some other aspects of life right now, and 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 soaking that up while at the same time trying to kind of figure out what I'm going to do next. And so I'm sure there will be an update on LinkedIn somewhat soon. Yeah. And I mean, just continuing to expand on that, right. Is your, your home life has, has brought you a lot of, of balance. Like we talked about, like I brought up earlier, but also having a child changes everything, right. As you get to see things uh, through different uh, eyes and perspective and everything else. Once you become a father, um, you want to talk about kind of, what what that's done for you and the growth that that you've experienced through that new role? Well, my team, my my common desk team back in the day would would say that my empathy went way up once I once I became a father, and so I think my son, who's seven now, I think he has taught me to be a bit of a better listener, a better a better leader, and so I think you know kids just naturally slow you down. A, a bit in in a very good way, and so no, I've I, I, I'm I'm glad I was able to you know bring him into the journey, and I, I always kind of led in a way where he he would he would go to a ton of meetings with me and knows a ton about the competition. I've got to teach him to stop talking bad about the competition and to learn from the competition because he's a very competitive, That's- but it, it was, it was, I'm glad he, you know, he was able to kind of grow up in that business a bit. And I'm hoping he has some really good memories of it um, that he can take away from the common dash gears as well. If he was to say three things that he loves about you, what would those three things be? Do you think? Well, he always, like, he'll literally tell Katie Joe, he's like, why does dad smile so much? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm uh I think I've got a pretty playful spirit. So yeah, him and I play his Roblox game together. We go on bike rides together. And so I honestly try to parent in a way where it feels like I'm just a older brother or a, a, a bigger kid to him. I'm not that big, but slightly bigger kid than him. And so I think it would probably be some, somewhere around that. And he does like my cooking, thankfully. So he would probably comment on that as well. Well, Nick, I mean, I love who you are as a person, how you've, you know, just poured so much of who you are into this industry, right? You've, from the very beginning, you've been someone that has been a leader in this flex industry and, you know, everything from Juicy to GWA, and then even starting, you know, alliances with with other co-working groups across the country with Lexi and kind of what what you've been able to grow there and really pouring into other operators, right? It, you you looked at competition as as not only a a, a student would, but also as a, a mentor would, because you I know that you had a lot of open conversations and still continue to with with people within the space. I will say that took some time, though. I, I would, in my early years of entrepreneurship, I don't, I don't know that I approached that correctly. But I, I think I learned over time that that the competition is something to study and to learn from, as opposed to, you know, just oppose with. And so, I think that's a part of the maturity journey in in entrepreneurship is learning that you do need to study your competition. You need to be close with them and and even help them at at times because there's going to be other times where you you need help. Um, but this industry is, it was easy to do that in co-working because this industry is full of, 
I mean, we feel this when we go to the co-working conferences, right? Uh, it's full of just fun people. That's that's something that if I do fully exit this industry that I will extremely miss because there are some good people in co-working. Well, I mean, I would tell you, even if you decide to exit, I mean, you're always, you're, you're part of, of the history of, of this community and, you know, you're always welcome with open arms because of, of who you are and what you've done. And I'm so grateful for, for our friendship and, and our relationship. I know Jamie would say the same. And so I'm excited to continue seeing you around in whatever capacity that is and, and having the ability to see kind of what you're going to build next. And so I, I know that's going to be awesome. Thank you so much for taking time to, to join us here and, and everything you've done. Since Jamie's not on, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. So what are the th three things that you love about Jamie? <laughs> I like that Jamie, Jamie is incredibly strict as with what she eats. And I appreciate that about her. I'll never forget like times in Sun Valley where she's up at like 5 a.m. doing some weird workout, like in the hallway or in the kitchen. It's like, what is, what is Jamie doing? So she's a very devoted, a very dedicated person. And Jamie, I think like me, likes, likes to have a very good time when she, when she's out and about with other people. And so I've always, I've always respected that. She's very put together, which I need to like surround myself. I think you, you call her an Enne Enneagram three, right? Yeah. Is Yeah. So she's a very detail oriented, put together person, which Gio, I think you and I both need to surround ourselves with a lot of Jamie's because we're the opposite of that. So without a doubt. Yeah. I have nothing bad to say about Jamie. She's incredible. Yeah, no, I mean, she she definitely brings balance to to, to our our relationship, and and that that's that's something that I definitely need because I don't do the details very well. So she focuses a, a lot on, on that. Yeah, and I know she she had to run early because she had an appointment she had to be to right on time. So she's yeah. left her picture up. So if you're watching the video, you just see Jamie's Jamie's photo. So. Nick, I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you, what you do next. And hopefully I'll see you around. I think you're going to be at Juicy, right? In the next couple of weeks. I don't plan no. on this Juicy, no. Uh, we're going to miss you. Well, yeah. I look forward to our next workout. And uh, yeah. I think you gave me the reins next time. So trying to see how I can torture you. Perfect. Uh, but I look forward to that and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. See you, man. Bye, Jamie.